Why, hello, friends. Welcome to the Valkaria stream. Happy Sunday. Those of you in Europe, it's still Sunday. For me, it's the next day. Yesterday was Saturday when we did the uh, Heimdall, Heimdall's Horn stream. So thanks to those of you who watched live last night. And if you missed that, if you were asleep, it's there waiting for you. Oh, yeah. So doubleheader this weekend. And both of these are sort of building on, of course, Odin Origins 3, Jon Snow, as well as the entire Odin Origins series. So hopefully you've watched those. But, uh, you know, you can watch these in any order. It's not really too much of a sequential thing. So today is we're going to mostly talk about Arya. We're going to mention a little bit Val, as well as Lady Stoneheart, Ghost of High Heart, perhaps. Uh, but mostly this is going to be an Arya stream. And the first thing I want to tell you is that I have an old Westeros.org friend named Sweet Sunray, one of the most intelligent people that I have come across in all of my uh, Song of Ice and Fire fandom experience. I've known her since I started writing essays and before I was making podcasts, let alone YouTube videos. So part of what we're going to be talking about today is the information in her essay, which is called Valkyrie of the Faceless Men. And it is on Westeros.org. You can easily find it just by looking up Valkyrie of the FM, Faceless Men. Uh, and I just dropped the link in the chat and I'll add it to the description. But essentially, um, you know, the first, the <laughs> it's easy to spot some of the obvious stuff with Arya, but there's, there's some deeper stuff too that Sweet Sun Ray unearthed and then I've built on these ideas and I've whipped up kind of a newer uh, theory about how I think this Valkyrie symbolism could come into play with Arya towards the end of the story. So, so yes, um, uh, okay, so <laughs> I have been promising a great stream for a couple weeks. I apologize. It is coming next week. I am going to have Elisa Patience on. That'll be next Sunday at the normal time, 3 Pacific. Uh, and um, a request for a summer hall video. Well... Of course, In Deep Geek has great uh, summer hall stuff. Um, I am actually, what I would more likely do is make a video about hard home. But my theory about hard home relates to summer hall and the doom. So you might get your wish. But the next one I'm actually, the next produced video I make will be something about a shy to go with the uh, the new Unseen Westeros a shy artwork. As I've mentioned a couple of times, Unseen Westeros project is... The, a really awesome thing. They they bring to life some of the more far-flung locations in the world in Sothorios and Essos and places like that. So check out Unseen Westeros if you haven't already. Um, and there is more, uh, like I said, more uh, coming. Uh, w the new batch of Unseen Westeros Ashai art in about a month to two months. And uh, they've asked me to make a new Ashai video to go with it, which I happily agreed to do. So yeah, I've got that coming as well. And then I got a, also Odin uh, Ragnarok, a Song of Ice and Fire idea. Uh, there's a Sansa video I want to make based on Edun from Norse Myth. So, yeah, um, that's all coming out. Thanks, Carl, for dropping in the Odin Origins links there. <laughs> a shy art. Oh, if you want all the shy maiden, a shy maiden, a shy made in a shy, all that word plays in uh, Weirwood Goddess series. And there's a lot of it. <laughs> but Ygritte is coming next week, um, and I might do a Val character stream too, be just because it'll sort of tie into what we're doing. But uh, so let's let's dive into this Aria stuff. And also, I am taking questions today. This is partly a Q and A. So any questions you have about any of the Norse myth videos that we've done so far, or brilliant observations that you have, uh, first choice PayPal.me Mythical Astronomy. That's the best way. You can also use the super chat function within YouTube. And I will be checking my email throughout and answering questions. Thanks to those of you who sent PayPal's in yesterday. I got a couple trickling in uh, over the last night and as I woke up this morning, which I have already used to summon the Garth delivery van. As I was saying last night, the Garth jar was running empty. Delivery van has come. So thank you guys for the bottom of my lungs and my heart and my calm brain. All right. So Let's dive into this Valkyrie of the First Men essay by Sweet Sunray. So she, 
Well, first, actually, let's talk about what the Valkyries are. Okay, so you guys probably have a vague concept, but I uh, to prep for this stream, I watched a couple of videos on the Jackson Crawford YouTube channel. He is a professor of Norse myth and languages. I've been recommending him for a few weeks now. So hopefully you guys know about Jackson Crawford, but I uh, watched a couple of his Valkyrie videos to, uh, to get prepared for this. So proper credit. Essentially, Valkyries, the word Valkyrie means chooser of the slain. A lot of you guys know that. And the idea is that the Valkyries, they don't kill people, but what they do is they wander the battlefields and they choose which fallen warriors should go to Valhall or Valhalla. So the word Val, V-A-L, in Valkyrie and Valhalla means corpse. It means a dead body on the battlefield. Uh, and then so Valkyrie, that's the anglicized form. The original form is like Valkyrior or something like that. And the, the second, so it means fallen, literally, Carl Karsnag pipes in. So yeah, fallen as in a fallen soldier, fallen warrior. The second part of the word means chooser. So it's chooser of the slain, chooser of the fallen warriors. And the warriors that they choose then go to um, Valhalla, Hall of the Fallen, and they await Ragnarok, at which time they will fight in Odin's army of undead warriors called the Einherjar. I think I'm saying that right. Um, so the Einherjar, they are, they, I mean, they, they are the inspiration for all of the zombie warriors you find, like in Lord of the Rings, when, um, uh, when uh, Aragorn goes into the cave and they've got the ghostly warriors and he calls them to fight. That seems like kind of a, uh, kind of sees like, that seems like a call out to that. Um, but the more important thing, obviously in A Song of Ice and Fire, we've got, we got two versions of this. We've got obviously all the clues about the Kings of Winter potentially waking from the crypts hopefully to fight on the side of the living, but perhaps not, maybe. Um, and then, uh, oh, thanks. I've got approval on my Ein Herjar pronunciation. Thank you. Um, so the more important thing is the green zombies, the Night's Watch itself. The Night's Watch, they're the ones who fight the others. They're the ones who rode out during the War for the Dawn to fight the Night's Watch. And my theory is that the original Night's Watchmen would have been like cold hands, or maybe like John is going to be. They would have been undead. There's lots of clues about it, but the bottom line is that undead people like Cold Hands are the perfect people to handle the North. They're not, they're not afraid of the cold. They don't need food or warmth, which are hard to come by, you know, in the frozen dead lands. So uh, the Night's Watch symbolism is all of dead people. That's why they wear black. And there's all... There's a bunch of wordplay around it. Check out the Sacred Order of Green Zombies 1, 2, and 3 for that whole theory. But essentially, it seems like to the extent that there are undead Night's Watchmen like Cold Hands, like John, like the original Last Hero maybe, uh, they are taking from the Einherjar, Odin's undead warriors, who are again chosen by the Valkyries. So, um, guys, I need to go flip off the bird light and make it nighttime. They are having a cow in there. Give me about 60 seconds. I will be right back. Check out my logo. Ah, the peacefulness of bird nap time. Okay. So the Valkyries, like I said, they choose the slain. They're supposed to go to Valhalla and then join this army of undead warriors that's going to fight for Odin at Ragnarok. This seems like a pretty obvious parallel to the idea of the Night's Watch in general, and specifically my theory about undead Night's Watchmen fighting the others during the original Long Night or the new Long Night. So, uh, Here's the thing. So let's go back to think about what Arya is doing. Arya is 
kind of doing something similar with the uh, House of Black and White. Um, and of course, the House of Black and White, the entire thing is functioning as a symbol of the inside of the Weirwood Net. It seems to be information about the others and about the Night's Watch and the Green Seers, all contained via symbolism in the House of Black and White. Um, but that's what it's about. That's why we have the Weirwood doors on the front. That's why the kindly old man has a worm in one eye, just like Blood Raven has a root in one eye that looks like a worm, on and on and on and on. Uh, they they wear the skins and faces of other people, just like the Green Seers wear the skins and faces of animals and occasionally people. Um, so it's I think I've gone over that before. So hopefully you guys have are familiar with that symbolism. Uh, and of course, obviously everything inside the House of Black and White symbolizes the realm of death. These are the servants of death, and that's very much what the inside of the Weirwood Knight is like. It's definitely the realm of the dead. Uh, and the green sayers are half dead or all dead inside the sort of, you know, weirwood net. So they, they, they sit in the dark, they draw strength from the darkness, like Blood Raven talks about and Brand talks about. So, yeah, I'm, I haven't gotten to Freya yet, but I will. And by the way, Freya is how you actually say the word that looks like Freya. It's actually Freya. So we will talk about her. Uh, she's pretty interesting as far as the Valkyries go. So, um, so the House of Black and White symbolizes the Weirwood Net, like I said. And so here we have Arya choosing people to go to the House of Black and White. Because remember, it's not just that she's killing people. Um, she, she, I've, and by the way, I am thinking about doing ASMR. Um, I'm. I need to make that money, guys. And uh, there's money to be had in the ASMR thing. So I was thinking about bedtime stories like old you know folk tales and stuff and i'll just read it in a bedtime story voice but if you have ideas for the for the david asmr channel let me know so i can get that cash quit uh stressing out so much in any case um so the house of black and white so what Arya is doing not only is she you know carrying out assassinations but think about what they do when they kill people um, they frequently skin them and take their face so that the faceless men can then use that face as a disguise. So in a way, the people that are killed by the House of Black and White are turned into undead warriors. Their faces, at least, live again and become these instruments of death that come out from the House of Black and White, which is the same thing symbolically as coming out of the Weirwood. And so you can see the setup here for Arya's Valkyrie symbolism, which is already in play in the House of Black and White to eventually carry over to something having to do with the Weirwoods in Westeros. And so I will get to that in a minute, but that's, that's essentially where this is going. So other thing about Valkyries uh, is that although they are often lusted after and inspire lust from men, they themselves are not interested in men. Uh, they are notoriously not interested in men. There's a couple of stories uh, where one Valkyrie will fall in love with a war chief, and even then will they'll get punished, um, and they have to become uh, less than a Valkyrie. And Valkyries, by the way, are, they do appear to be mortal women who kind of receive a power-up of a kind of boost, but they're not like a different race, like the Yatna or something. Um, and we see we see a couple of stories of Valkyries, like I said, get punished and they, they're not a Valkyrie anymore. Um, uh, so in any case, the Valkyries, like I said, they are not interested in men. And you can see that with Arya where she's, she's trading. She's obviously very young. However, uh, the, the kindly man tells her the God of many faces will take every part of you, including your private parts. So that's in, it's implying that the uh, they are um, that Arya is giving up her, you know, her choice to have children, like the 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 lifetime, the life path where she's going to have children. She's choosing against that by choosing to become a faceless man. If you think about it, I don't think the faceless men like go home from the temple to like a family and they're like, "How's work, honey? Oh, you know, I killed some people and bombed some folks, and uh, how was your day?" No, I don't think so. So yeah, no, I don't think Arya will be getting with Gendry. Um, 
Although the thing about Arya is that she's not a pure faceless man. She is breaking some of the rules and there's some other stuff. So perhaps that's not completely determinative, but I suspect Arya will not be <laughs> getting with Gendry at the end of the story. It's probably not something that she will choose. Um, so uh, the, the Valkyries are not completely asexual. They are sexualized in their image. Although again, it's important to remember with any mythology that the idea of something like a Valkyrie or a god or goddess evolves over time. Um, like we're gonna talk about Freya in a minute. Freya and Frigg are probably the same goddess, but they may have been separate at, at a certain point and then sort of got joined in together through synchronization. Uh, synch god damn it, it's that word, when the myths get combined. Um, so, uh, you know, there's some complexity there. However, what we, the best picture we have of the Valkyries is that they themselves are not interested in men, although men lust after them. And uh, syncretism, thank you, Carl. Jackson Crawford actually has a little bit of his own theory about the Valkyries, that they essentially represent uh, battle lust. So, right, exactly, Yen said, battle lust and sexual lust are comparative. So uh, Jackson was actually hypothesizing that the Valkyries are essentially a conceptualization of battle lust. So men either lust after women and sex or they lust after that battle frenzy. And that sort of, uh, that sort of reminds me a lot of how Odin's sort of shamanic madness can either be the poetic artistic inspiration or the battle frenzy. Um, so it's like that same, the Vikings would, would look to that central sort of fire and see the ways that it manifests and say, well, that's the same fire. And so this is a similar thing with the Valkyries. Like they represent the battle lust. Um, and so they also, there's a little bit of, um, there's a little bit of a death mother goddess idea. Like if you remember Kali, she's very violent and she's, you know, she's got all this death symbolism, but it also, it represents like the embrace of the tomb, the rest of the tomb the idea that our souls are being processed in a cycle of reincarnation that Kali is like churning and running. Um, so there is kind of an embrace and that's similar to the, the house of black and white where death, death is sometimes a gift uh, or get, you know, uh, an act of mercy. Um, so you can see the Valkyries taking the spirits of the fallen from the battlefield, escorting them to Valhalla. It is kind of like a motherly loving action in a way. Um, so, Valkyrie idea is pretty complex. It's pretty interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's actually, I got a quote. Hopefully I still have it handy here. Uh, I don't, I'll pull it up. There's a funny quote about Val where, where this exact phraseology is used about uh, lusting after battle. Let's see here. Okay, so when his cup, and this is Stannis, uh, Melisandre, Val, John, all standing around here at the wall, it says, when his cup was filled, the king drank, and he said, Horp and Massey aspire to your father's seat. Okay, so Val's not here. It's Stannis and John are talking about Val. That's what's going on. Stannis says, Horp and Massey aspire to your father's seat, meaning Winterfell. Massey wants the wildling princess, too. He once served my brother Robert as squire and acquired his appetite for female flesh. And then he says, Horp will take Val to wife if I command it, but it is battle he lusts for. So that's an interesting comparison. So like, yeah, he'll marry Val if he's commanded to, but really he lusts for battle. But Val, of course, as I alluded to in the John video, is also a Valkyrie figure, it seems. And so lusting after Val is essentially the same thing as lusting after battle. So one guy lusts after Val in the carnal way, and the other guy will marry Val, but really lusts after battle. So Martin is giving us that dual lust right around Val in that quote. So that's that's a pretty cool one that I found. And uh, yeah, it is 420 uh, uh, Midwest. Rocky, so Rocky Mountain, ah, happy 420. Um, there you go. So now another thing about the Valkyries is that they are from the noble classes. Um, that is why they usually are depicted with blonde hair. Blonde hair in Viking society is associated with the noble classes. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm, 
Lazar, that's a little bit off topic. I'm not really. That's yeah. Sorry. I mean, that's 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 a little. That's not what I'm. Uh, there are similarities between the wild hunt and the others, but that's a little far afield. So, um, the Valkyries are from noble classes, and of course, Arya is very unusual for a faceless man in that she is a noble. Um, it's a, and that's spelled out. You know, she tries to hide and and hide in these disguises as a peasant, but she is. Uh, yeah, thank you, Isabel. Yeah, we're all peasants, really. Um, but then, of course, she really is nobility. So this fits with the Valkyries. And then, of course, Val is called a, the princess over and over and over again, even though she says, oh, I'm just, you know, the brother. I'm just uh, Dalla's sister who, you know, married the king of the north. That doesn't mean shit. But kind of does. Val is definitely treated like royalty. So there you go. All right. So um, let's pull up. OK, so I'm pulling up Sweet Sunray's essay here. And. She is pointing out, uh, so the Valkyries, choosers of the slain, like I said, they often serve as cupbearers in their time off. They serve as cupbearers in Valhall, Valhalla. Uh, and if Arya does a lot of cupbearer stuff. Um, they are sometimes depicted as beautiful young women, although other times they're old women. So I think that's something that's evolved over time. Um, battles and fights are dedicated to them, although they do not actively participate. And if you think about Arya, she actually doesn't do a lot of fighting. Um, she, her assassinations are carried out, you know, through deception and guile for the most part. Even Daron, she kind of punked. She tricked him into going into the alley uh, and then gutted him probably when he wasn't looking. So, uh, and the same thing for um, the way that she took down whichever bloody mummer that she murdered in horrific fashion in the Winds of Winter preview chapter that we got of Arya. So that's pretty consistent. Um, the Valkyries are, they serve Odin, of course, and Arya is serving the House of Black and White, which has all the weirwood symbolism. The kindly man has the blood raven one eye Odin symbolism. And ultimately Arya will be acting in concert with Bran, who has the Odin symbolism. So um, the Valkyries are also believed to know a God's will when it comes to who's supposed to die. <clears throat> which is very similar to the way that the faceless men talk about, um, you know, who is supposed to die. So then, so I'm going through Sweet Sunray's essay here real quick. And the very first interaction that Arya has with a faceless man, Jaken lifts his empty tag tankard and says, a man could use a taste of beer. A man has a thirst. So he's asking Arya to play cupbearer right from the beginning. Um, and then, that continues at Heron Hall. Um, she serves the table uh, at Roos Bolton for Weiss. Uh, so over and over again, she's doing this cupbearer thing even before she gets to the House of Black and White. And then when she gets to the House of Black and White, she literally does cupbearer stuff at the dinner. Um, so that symbolism is really, really clear. Then uh, let's see here. She, again, um, if you think about Harrenhal, Sweet Sunray points out that at the fight at Harrenhal, she doesn't do any fighting. Um, she does the soup and she runs a lot of deception, but she doesn't actually fight anybody. And then uh, Jaken wipes the bloody sword on her shirt to say, you know, you, you, you had a hand in this. But he does that specifically because she doesn't have any blood on her because she doesn't fight. Um, then... She basically engineers this battle that happens. The battle gets dedicated to her, just as battles were dedicated to the Valkyries. Everyone talks about the weasel soup and gives her credit for the whole thing. So this all fits pretty well there. And then what she's doing is she's also, um, she's liberating dead, uh, not dead men, but men from prison that are condemned to die that are Starks. <clears throat> so she liberates these Starks and they, um, you know, Starks and Stark allies. And that that could be more foreshadowing for Arya helping to choose some sort of army for Jon, you know, which is, again, where I'm going with this whole theory. So she's she's essentially not, she's uh, choosing people to join an army that were condemned to die. So that seems a little bit like 
choosing fallen soldiers to, to go to Valhalla to join Odin's army. So then, um, <clears throat> yeah, let's actually, let's actually talk about, no, I don't want to do that yet. Sorry. I'm, I didn't do an outline today, so I'm trying to decide on the fly what order I'm going to do things in. Let me stick with Sweet Sunray's essay for a second. It's just a couple more points I want to make from here. So she engineers the weasel soup rebellion. The battle essentially is dedicated to her. <clears throat> She also walks around like a ghost. It's called the ghost in Hall. So she's sort of roaming the battlefield, if you will. Um, then, let's see here. Uh, she does more cupbearer stuff with Sandor. She gives water to dying people in a couple villages with the Bloody Mummers. So she continues to do the cupbearer thing. And she's also like she's consistently serving people who die. If you think about the House of Black and White, when she first got there, she gave somebody a drink from the fountain without really knowing what she was doing and was helping them die by doing so. So her cupbearer stuff is associated with dying people pretty consistently. Um, and then even goes, Sandor even begs her for water. And she does, she gives him water, but then does not give him the gift of mercy. So she's doing the cupbearer thing. She's choosing who dies and who doesn't. Um, Sweet Sunray is saying, you know, because she doesn't kill Sandor, perhaps that's, a way of sort of choosing him to go live on the quiet aisle and have a new life there. The quiet aisle being sort of like a Valhalla. It's got all the weirwood symbolism on there. It's an island, just like the Isle of Faces with a hidden sanctuary and all this stuff. So then let's see here. Um, and by the way, Sweet Sunray is actually positing a theory about Arya in this essay, which is that the faceless men might have some sort of prophecy about Arya and that Arya might be more similar to the first faceless man who might have been a woman. Uh, and she's got some pretty good reasoning for speculating this. So I will not go into that, but rather give you a reason to go read the essay for yourself and give Sweet Sunray some love. And by the way, Sweet Sunray has uh, a WordPress blog. This essay is on westeros.org, but she has a WordPress blog and let me look it up here. It is called Mythological Weave of Ice and Fire. The web address is sweeteisandfiresunray.com. And I'm dropping that in here. So go subscribe to her blog. She's got some really cool essays on there. If you like my stuff, you'll probably dig some of her stuff for sure. It's a lot of the same sort of style of symbolic and mythological analysis. So there you go. Shout out all credit to Sweet Sunray. In any case, uh, the end of this essay, I'm just looking up here. And that's pretty much it. Now, there's a patron question that dovetails with this from Jinty M, who's in the chat. She says, though Ny through Nymeria, Arya not only witnesses her mother's resurrection, but actively, albeit unconsciously, facilitates it by dragging her from the water for the Brotherhood to find. I feel like she needs to see the consequences of this by coming face to face with Stoneheart. My question is, do you think this will make her an even darker Avenger going forward or temper her a bit going forward to see the past face value who does or doesn't deserve uh, mercy? Um, I don't know that Stoneheart's gonna last long enough to meet Arya, but it would be certainly appropriate if she did. Um, I don't think that's, I'm not sure how that's going to hit her. I mean, if Arya would be giving her the gift of mercy, if so. Uh, but I think Arya is going to be pretty dark going forward, no matter what. So <clears throat> that's kind of a given. What, what I find interesting, though, is that this is more Valkyrie action. She's choosing someone to become undead, essentially, right? That's what she did by pulling Stoneheart out of the, out of the water. And then... Stoneheart herself is doing symbolic Valkyrie stuff because what's her favorite method of execution? Hanging. And hanging is just a symbol for Yggdrasil transcendence. I put the R, <laughs> I rolled my R on transcendence instead of Yggdrasil. Sorry. <clears throat> transcendence. In any case, that is, there's green seer symbolism aplenty with Stoneheart. She lives in a weirwood cave and then hangs people on trees. 
So symbolically, she's showing us the idea of a weirwood goddess, a.k.a. Nissa Nissa or uh, Night's Queen, bringing people into the weirwood net. That's the symbolism of hanging that's happening there. So that's a Valkyrie action as well. Oh, yeah. Let me take a break here. That's pretty much uh, the the, Val uh, the Valkyrie of the First Men, uh, fa a Faceless Men essay. Um, she does, Sweet Sunrays got some more stuff backing up the idea of the Faceless Men having a prophecy that Arya fits. Um, this sort of explains why they keep promoting her, even though she's not exactly following the rules and why they're sort of treating her as an exception and the idea that she's a skin changer and all this stuff. So pretty cool theory and I recommend checking it out, but let me hop over to PayPal's here because I've got some PayPal's from you kind folks. <clears throat> Amy says green for some more green. Thank you. And gratitude for the North Smith series. You're seriously going to capstone this with Azor Ahai. Yeah, definitely. Azor Ahai has got so much Odin symbolism. So yeah, it's definitely going to happen. Enjoy the weeks of Mercury retrograde. No, I'll be living in fear of those. Uh, thank you, Amy. <laughs> Ludmila. At a different time, you said the others are displaced tree spirits and also that they are green seers who died and went into the trees and got displaced by Azor High. And also that the green seers forcing their way into the trees is an abomination. Do these contradict each other or am I confused? Well, the way that you phrased it is a little contradictory. <laughs> but yeah, let me see if I can explain that. After I hit this bottle of Henny. Pretty much vanquishing it there. So here's how that works. Thank you for asking. Originally, I believe that green seers were not humans. They would have been children of the forest, or more importantly, the green men. The green men are really the thing here. So the green men are one of the old races. They come from Lang, or maybe they come from everywhere, and they're just only left on Lang and the Isle of Faces. Check out my uh, green men series about that. But the green men are the original green seers. Garth the Green planted weirwoods matches the description of the green men. The green men guard the weirwoods. The green men are in every way associated with the weirwoods. <clears throat> so what I believe is that the green men were used, the, they, the weirwoods were essentially the afterlife for the green men and the children of the forest, just like they, we, they are presented as the afterlife of the children of the forest now. What happened was, <laughs> what happened was, uh, Azor High came along being a human or maybe even a, a, a bad green man or some other race or who knows what, a dragon, definitely a prototype dragon lord person. <clears throat> he comes along, he wants access to the weirwood net. And so what happens is when he invades the weirwood net, all those dead green men spirits, the original green seer spirits that are living a cozy afterlife in the weirwood trees, they get pushed out and evicted. <clears throat> Those shadows that are pushed out become the others through various other processes of magic. That's not important. But the point is, these are green men spirits inside the weirwood trees. So those are both tree spirits and dead green seers. Same, same thing. They get evicted when someone who doesn't belong in there, which is Azor High, invades the weirwood tree. <clears throat> this is like the lightning striking the tree, setting fire to the tree. It's uh, Nissa Nissa and, Az and uh, the weirwoods are parallel. So Azor Ahai stabbing Nissa Nissa or impregnating Nissa Nissa is the exact same symbolism as Azor Ahai sending his spirit into the weirwood tree. It's an invasion. It's an abomination, et cetera, et cetera. So Azor Ahai becoming the first abomination green seer, human green seer, is also the action that pushes out the green seer spirits that creates the others. So that is how that all works together in, in my diseased adult brain or whatever. That's, that's, that's my head cannon. Uh, so let's see, next PayPal question. I think I have, I'm getting so many, it's hard to keep track. 
from yesterday and today. Good problem to have, right? Um, let's see here. Uh, oh, Aaron, yes, for the empty Garth jar. Thank you, Aaron. And Will Ferran overnight. There we go. So we're all caught up. Cool. Thank you, guys. So I'm scrolling back. I haven't, and you guys will always help me if I miss a super chat, right? I don't think I have. All right, cool. So let's talk about Freya for a minute. So Odin's wife is Frigg. Um, then there's this other goddess named Freya. Looks like Freya, but it's Freya. And her wife is a fellow called Other, which is just another name for Odin. So what it seems like is that uh, Freya and Frigg are the same goddess. They are the wife of Odin. And there is a missed super chat. Great. So I didn't see it. So if you could just repeat the question, I will answer it. Because it was too far back to scroll back and get. But if we repeat the question, I will answer it. <clears throat> I have people telling me that I missed it. But I need the question again. So, Freya and Frigg, same person, same goddess, wife of Odin. And here's the thing. So, there's, there's this idea that Snorri popularized. Uh, and that Jackson Crawford believes is a little bit of a mistranslation, essentially. Um, no, I do not wear makeup. Unless, unless I have like a bird bite on my nose, then I'll, I'll cover that up. But otherwise, no. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, no, I, Azor Ahai is the Bloodstone Emperor. Is my that's the whole idea. That was <laughs> that's what I said in my in uh, my second essay, Bloodstone Compendium Number Two. So you're not going out on a limb here. That's that's well trod, well trod territory. Yeah, that's the whole point. Same same folks. <clears throat> so the th here's the thing. So Freya, she is said to do a Valkyrie like thing where she chooses some of the dead, half of the dead, it says, to go to her hall, which is thought of um, as being different than Valhalla. And let me look up the name for it real quick. I've just I had it in my head and escaped me. So let's see. Mm -mm -mm. Folkvanger, that's what it is. Yeah, Folkvanger. So she supposedly receives half of the dead to Folkvanger, and the other half go to Valhalla. This is the common belief about Freya. But here's the thing. Uh, Jackson pulled up the actual verse that this is from, that Snorri originally drew from, and it seems that it is... Uh, okay, I see the super chat. Thank you. Thank you, Lazar. So it seems that um, it's possible that that uh, Folkvanger is actually the same thing as Valhalla. And that what the verse is actually saying is that um, Freya chooses half the dead to go to uh, Folkvanger, and then um, Odin owns half the dead. And so people, uh, Snorri thought that, oh, well, this is one half and then the other half. But the thing is, in Viking culture... Um, it is common for the wife to set the table, meaning assign the places where people sit in the hall. And in this same verse, it says, Freya chooses every day, you know, the seating in Odin's hall. So Jackson thinks that what's happening here is that it's, it's actually saying that Freya is like the head Valkyrie and that she is choosing half of the dead to go sit in Odin's hall, which is also called Folkvanger. So it's actually Snorri that came along later and made those separate places. But it's possible that they're not separate places. And what this would mean is that um, Freya is actually the first Valkyrie. And this makes a lot of sense for a lot of reasons. But let me pause and get this super chat that I missed. Thank you, Lazar, for catching this. Jake and Hagar is possibly a noble as well. Um, so that's two House of Black and White Assassins that are noble. What's the clue that Jaken is noble? I was not aware of that line of thinking. Um, so I'm not sure what the clue is. But um, yeah, I'm not sure. 
Oh, am I <laughs> Lazar? Is that not is a uh, is it? How do how am I supposed to pronounce it? Oh, I I often mispronounce people's names in ways that they like. Shout out to Delise. <laughs> Uh, in any case, well, he likes it, so I'll go with it. So in any case, um, Freya then would be the first Valkyrie. And this makes a lot of sense because Freya is known as, she's very beautiful and she inspires lust and love from all creatures, not only men, but giants and dwarves and elves. Everyone desires Freya. And there's all these stories about people doing crazy things to, to please her. Um, so... This sounds a lot like Val, right? She is so beautiful that everyone is falling all over themselves and making great gallant fools of themselves. Somebody even tries to slay the giant, right? Uh, what's his name? Uh, the, the guy with the Dallas Cowboys stars, I think it's Patrick of King's Mountain that gets smashed by Woon Woon up against the wall. Um, so this is this is very uh, this is this is very similar to Freya. And, and remember what I was saying about lust, right? Um, the idea is that the Valkyries, they are the embodiment of battle lust versus regular, you know, non-Valkyrie women men lust for in a sexual and a romantic way. So then you have Freya who inspires, she's more famous for inspiring romantic ardor, but if she's also the original Valkyrie, then she's also inspiring the battle lust. And that fits in very much with... Um, with this more complex idea of Freya and the Valkyries as symbolizing these two sides of, of love. And so this, I think it makes a lot of sense. So again, credit to Jackson Crawford, check out his video on the Valkyries for the full explanation on that. Um, but it's pretty cool because again, this really makes sense of Val. Val seems to fit both the Valkyrie and Freya as well. Um, so pretty cool. And then of course, um, uh, Frigg is Odin's wife. So if Freya and Frigg are the same woman, which they appear to be the same goddess, then the idea that John and Val potentially could have been married makes a lot of sense because John is an Odin figure and Val is a Freya figure. So very cool. John and Val as uh, Odin and Frigg or Freya. <clears throat> and uh, let's see, I think I had... One other point about that I wanted to make. What was it? It'll come back to me. So I hope you guys are enjoying this. <clears throat> well, I guess I'll go ahead and go on to make my final point here. So how can Arya's symbolism really, really take hold and become meaningful? So Arya's going to come back to Westeros, right? <clears throat> She's going to come back to Westeros. And she's going to be helping John and Bran. She's obviously she's going to lead the wolf pack. She's going to be, you know, killing lots of people that need killing with the wolf pack. Yada yada yada. Here's the thing, though. <clears throat> like I said, the Ein Hajar, the Ein Hariar, sorry, they are Odin's undead army. Those are the, the the Valkyries are choosing the dead to join this undead army, and they're going to fight at Ragnarok for Odin. So this is very, and thank you, Carl, there's the uh, Valkyrie Jackson Crawford video. So this, I believe, correlates to the idea of the new Night's Watch, preferably some undead Night's Watchmen, to help John and Danny journey into the heart of winter and melt the frozen weirwood tree or whatever magic they've got to do in the heart of winter to sort of get this whole thing unstuck. So what I think is that it would make sense if Arya helps choose or even helps kill the people that will become John's undead last hero's dozen, the new green zombie watch. They should be chosen by a Valkyrie, right? I mean, that's there's such a good analog to Odin's undead army. So we need a Valkyrie figure to choose these people to join John's watch. So we could even see Val and Arya take a hand in this. So this is... <clears throat> this is how I think this is going to go down. Um, by the time Arya gets back to Winterfell and back to Westeros, she's going to be helping John assemble that team. She might be one of them as well. Um, we do have this idea that if you look at, uh, 
Okay, so over in YT, there is a war leader of the YT who's a woman, and she's called uh, Zia, Zor uh, Zia Zorsface, which is obviously meant to remind us of Arya Horseface. And Zia Zorsface has last hero symbolism. There's a 13 going on, and the YT, the Yeetish are essentially like the others in this story. And so it's one of those ones that people ask me about. It's in the back of the World of Ice and Fire. So check out the, the section on the Yi and the Jogos Nai. But the whole point of the story is to imply Arya, an Arya parallel figure, Zia Zor's face, as a last hero figure. Um, Arya also has last hero and Azor High symbolism in other places. She already symbolically joined the Watch, didn't she? That's right. She joined the Watch when she posed as Ari and Yorin took her from King's Landing. So the idea if um, if Arya joins John's group or helps John form his group, then this would fit the Valkyrie symbolism and it would fit that foreshadowing as well. I also think of the story of brave Danny Flint joining the Night's Watch and posing as a boy. This could have to do with Arya joining the Watch or it could you know, indicate Danny even it could foreshadow Danny's part in joining John and his Night's Watch group to journey north of the wall. Um, so, yes. <clears throat> and I saw a super chat just now. <laughs> Dirty Dozen, don't stay down. Don't you doubt it. Yeah, it's the whole point of being undead. Harder to kill. What is, what is dead can never die. So I'm looking for Arya to take a role in creating this new Night's Watch with John. And this would be the perfect fulfillment of her Valkyrie symbolism. And again, that's essentially what she is doing um, with the House of the Undying. House of, I'm sorry, not the House of the Undying. The House of Black and White, where she's choosing the people that die, whose skins will then be worn by the, the warriors that come out of the Death Temple. So if she helps kill people that will be resurrected through weird magic to become like cold hands, this is very similar uh, symbolism. <clears throat> okay, so last point on the Valkyries. I remembered what it was. Oh, totally. She is. Yeah, so when she kills Daron, so Daron is a Night's Watchman. Thank you very much, Isabel. This is great. Darren is a Night's Watchman. Arya kills him and then throws him into the water, into the sea. And the canals of Bravos are specifically spelled out as being like the Weirwood Net, which has many canals and it's like a maze. So the, there's tons of maze symbolism that's always attached to the Weirwoods. And so here we have a watery maze of canals in Bravos. So yes, this is perfect foreshadowing and more confirmation of my new theory Arya will be killing Night's Watchmen, who will be then going into the Weirwood Net and coming back out as green zombies. Nice. Very nice. <clears throat> so who would I choose to die and be resurrected on Join John? Well, Jamie's a good candidate. Um, maybe Sam, but probably not Sam. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'd have to give some thought to that. So the... Um, Another thing about the Valkyries that Jackson pointed out is that they have overlap with Swan Maiden mythology. Uh, the Valkyries have wings and they fly. They said to fly over the battlefield. And in a couple of stories, the, uh, <clears throat> the Valkyries, uh, we see them lose their swan skin. So there's one where three Valkyries are seen bathing on the shore and their swan skins and their wings are next to them. And some people come along and steal the swan skins, and this enables them to force the Valkyries to marry them. So they're taking the Valkyries against their will as wives, but only for seven years, and then they get their skins, their swan skins back. <clears throat> and of course, that sounds that is very much like a lot of the uh, swan maiden mermaid mythology. Think about the little mermaid. When she comes out of the water, she loses something. She's kind of, you know, captive to this man and then, you know, goes back to the water. Um, there's a whole history of swan maiden folklore. It's very rich and developed. So there's, there's many, many little versions and deviations of it. 
<clears throat> but yes, it has to do with sh stolen shapeshifter skins. Ooh, we can make a tongue twister out of it. Stolen shapeshifter. She sells stolen shapeshifter skins by the she shore. <laughs> or like she steals. All right. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, and then of course the Swan Maiden mythology is used in a song of ice and fire in a couple places as well with Hugo the Andal. And then the main thing is that when Arya is by the God's eye with all of its weirwood symbolism, she sees swans in the lake, shout out Swan Lake, and thinks she's not sure whether she'd rather eat one of the swans or be one of the swans. So Arya becoming a swan on the God's eye with all of its weirwood net sea symbolism, this is more another way of telling us that Arya is a swan maiden, but not the not the nice kind. She's she's a Valkyrie like swan maiden. So thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, Hans Christian Andersen definitely has has got some swan maiden stories. That's what I'm talking about. <clears throat> what about Danny the warrior queen? Well, the thing is the Valkyries actually weren't warriors. They're depicted wearing armor and they often have weapons and stuff, but they don't actually fight. Um, of course, I guess Danny doesn't really fight either that we've seen. She leads from the front. She rides the dragon. Um, of course, in the show, she wielded a sword. Uh, she's definitely not afraid, but she doesn't actually do hand-to-hand -hand combat. So that could be a match. I don't think Danny's really a Valkyrie, though. Uh, she's yeah, she's she's more taking after like mother goddesses and stuff. But maybe if we think about Freya, that would have more of more meaning. Danny obviously does inspire love and lust from people high and low. So that that part fits. I'd have to think about it more though. I don't want to just throw it out there without really thinking about it. Yeah, the Selkie folklore is the same thing. Selkies, mermaids, swan maidens, those that's all the same tree of mythology. Uh, let's see here. <clears throat> I'm just double checking the patron questions. Most of the patron questions were actually about Heimdaller. Uh, and Gus was asking about the cupbearer thing. I covered that already. Um, so yes, definitely a reference to the Ein Heriar. That's for sure. Let me just refresh this page, make sure there's not a new comment. Cool. Looks like I got them all. So in the world of ice and fire, Cyril McLeod says, the Lorath third person style of speaking, a man is now only used by nobles. So Jaken is a noble. Oh, ah, okay. That's the clue. I knew there was one. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Cool, very interesting. Um, and uh, the first faceless, so Sweet Sunray in her essay speculates that the first faceless man was a woman and that she would have been a Valerian noble, perhaps a, a, a doctor or a medical woman who was already in a medical woman, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, a nurse type person who was, who was perhaps in charge of feeding or helping slaves you know, down in the mines, she would have been in position to hear the slaves cry out for mercy. She would have been in a position to give the gift of mercy. <clears throat> and uh, that would fit with the Valkyrie idea of a noble woman. Um, so again, check out Sweet Sunrise essay. I'll drop the link yet again. It's going to be a, in the description of the video. So if you're watching after the fact, you'll find it in the description. Um, but I like that. Oh, so Lazar, your name is pronounced Elazar. Ah, oh, cool. Yeah, Elazar. Oh, Elazor. Elazora Hi Radonovich. Uh, Rado Radovan Radovanovich. There you go. I scrambled the letter. I think I have mild dyslexia, by the way. I realized when I was trying to type something last night. But uh, anyways, that's a story for another day. There's an idea going around in the chat. What is it? Perhaps Danny's the dreamer. I don't think so because the first, um, the first faceless men would have then 
recruited more faceless men. That's the story. The first one recruited the second, and this is what started the order. So I don't think she could have also been living the life as Danny's the dreamer on Dragonstone or whatever with Aenar Targaryen and also be the first faceless man. So that I don't think that would work. Yeah. So they, they say poison is a, is a woman's weapon. That's another clue that because the faceless men always use poison. Uh, that's definitely their main technique. So that's another clue that the first faceless man might've been a faceless woman, perhaps. Um, Um, yeah, also not the same time. I think that's correct, Destiny. I believe that the faceless men, they snuck away. They, they, yeah, I mean, they snuck away from Valeria like a hundred years before the doom. Uh, so yeah, the time doesn't line up either. That is correct. Good knowledge. Good knowledge. No, o well, Oberyn uses poison. That's correct. He, he, uh, he did not poison Tywin. I don't think. I don't think he poisoned Tywin, but he certainly did poison that spear and poisoned the mountain. <clears throat> but maybe he poisoned Tywin. I guess I'm not sure. I, I think I was more against that theory until I read it. And then I was like, oh, okay, maybe, maybe. I like the idea that uh, multiple people wanted to kill Tywin. That is kind of funny. So... Mm, there's... so uh, Yeah, so Hell, or Hela is the god of is a goddess of death um and obviously female so that could be a correlation to the first faceless men and melisandre and danny do have hell parallels to the people have pointed out so that could be a thing um odin also is a god of death of course too and that's why you know he is partnered with the valkyries and rules over a hall of the dead and leads an army of the dead and all that stuff so <clears throat> Good knowledge in the chat today, guys. Thank you. You guys are awesome. So I will go ahead and take last call for questions here. I tend to do a little shorter live stream when I do the double header. So I did about an hour and a half last night. And, oh, I've, I have another find about John in the wall and the Bifrost Bridge. Yes, totally. Let me look this up. Porch, not match. That's right. <clears throat> okay, so. Oh, man. Hang on a second. Oh, it might be in storm. That's right. It'll be worth it. Sorry for the, the, the downtime here. Okay, so um, John is thinking about the choice that he to marry Val that he's just rejected. Remember, Stannis said, marry Val, become the Lord of Winterfell, but John turns it down because he doesn't feel right about it. He would have had to burn the weirwood, and he's pledged to the watch. <clears throat> so he's thinking about John, or John's thinking about Val, and he says, uh, yeah, she's good looking, all true enough, but the wildling woman was so much more. She had proved that by finding Tormund, where seasoned rangers of the watch had failed. She may not be a princess, but she would make a worthy wife for any lord. But that bridge had been burned a long time ago, and John himself had thrown the torch. So, John burning bridges that lead to Valkyries. So, this sounds a lot like the Bifrost Bridge, parallel to the wall, because the Bifrost Bridge leads to Valhalla. So, it literally leads to the place where the Valkyries are, and that bridge is, of course, destroyed by the fire giant Surtr and all of his other fire giants from Muspelheim. And so I've pointed out last night, check out the stream from last night, there's a lot of symbolism that John's going to have something to do with breaking the wall, that the comet or meteor will be involved, something like that. That's the parallel to Surtr's flaming sword. And so here we have John 
saying that that bridge was burned and John himself had thrown the torch. So this is yet another clue about, you know, because remember the comet is called Mormont's torch. So think of John throwing a torch at the wall, throwing the comet at the wall. That parallels the quotes about John's rage being such that he would smash the wall in an instant if he could, the wall being the end of the world, all this stuff, all the ice dragon symbolism that I went over in the uh, the, the Night's King Jon Snow video. So pretty cool. More Bifrost Bridge burning and destruction and literally spelled out as the Bifrost because it leads, this is the bridge that led to Val. He was a Valkyrie. So pretty cool stuff. Will we see an ice dragon in the winds of winter? <clears throat> I used to put the odds at just over 50% because I think that Martin really is attached to the idea of the ice dragon and wants to give it to us. Um, I'm trying to figure out how it will fit in. So I might be a little more skeptical of it now, but I do think there's a good chance we'll see an ice dragon. Maybe deep in the heart of winter when John and Danny go there. But it could end up just being Viserion getting turned or transformed. I think that's could could definitely something more like what the show happens could go down as well. Because Viserion has a ton of ice dragon symbolism. So if he gets transformed, it would make a lot of sense. <clears throat> Do -do -do. Downtown Clanny. Yeah, I can I can mod you. Hang on a second. Let's do it. If you're asking for it, that means you're ready for the responsibility. You're going to take it seriously. Wield the hammer with judiciousness. Let's see here. Where are you? Downtown Clowny Brown. Done. I boom. I've just boomed you. You're a moderator. What is happening, Greg? <laughs> Ice asks. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure. I think I'm taking last call for questions here. But um, yeah, I, that's really all I wanted to say about Val Valkyria. She's Arya has Valkyrie symbolism. It's it all seems like it's leading up to the idea of her joining the Night's Watch, helping John form his last watch. Uh, so I definitely think this is coming. Is there a missed super chat? Let me know if so. Oh, look at that. Valeria. If you put a K in the middle of Valeria, you get the title of this stream, Valkaria, almost. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's intended or not. Interesting, though. He's using that vowel word uh, prefix a lot. <clears throat> but of course, if the Faceless Men are Valkyries, and the first one was a Valkyrie, and she was a Valerian, and they started in, in Valeria, that, that sort of all makes sense. Oh, is it, a, is it a PayPal that I am not catching? Let me see here. Sometimes they're delayed on the email. Mm -mm, mm -mm. How many have we got watching, by the way? Let me just remind you, uh, click the like button. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel. And when you click the notification bell, you got to scroll down and click all notifications, too. Make sure you uh, do that. So otherwise, it'll only tell you about some of the live streams and videos. Oh, yeah, one from Amelia. With an ASMR suggestion. Developing on themes of astral projection and weird net dimension with emphasis on the transformative effects of turning ends into beginnings. ASMR with the mantras of a Song of Ice and Fire characters, like fear cuts deeper than swords. This is a good idea, but would probably take too much work. I'm looking for a revenue stream that would take... <clears throat> less time. So the idea of like reading old stories that are out of like copyright protection, 
I just basically pick it up and read. And, and so that's probably like more the direction I'm going to go. Um, Cause pretty much what you're talking about is like my old podcast. <laughs> that's, that's which a lot of people tell me, by the way, they listen to sometimes my podcast to fall asleep, which is what gave me the idea to do ASMR bedtime stories. So there you go. Or gave my friend the idea to suggest to me anyways, same thing pretty much. Oh, and by the way, we are working on, uh, somebody approached me for, uh, with a t-shirt idea. It's going to be a Garth 420 related shirt. So I don't want to spoil the surprise, but it's a new t-shirt coming. It's going to be pretty funny. Old Nan voice ASMR. Oh, <laughs> that's going to be bad. How about Blood Raven ASMR? <clears throat> Reed is suggesting to do cameos, but like for IG videos via PayPal or burning questions. <clears throat> well, I will say that I should say this more. You can, if you have random questions for me during the week, you can also send those in paypal.me mythical astronomy, and I will just get them during the next Q and A. You guys see that I tend to do that. Um, sometimes I pull old questions forward and answer them. So that is definitely a way to get your questions answered. Odin and Frigg share a throne that lets them see across the nine realms. Do you think Bran and Arya's parallel awakening of their gifts is a nod to this? Hmm. Oh, I see what you're saying, right? Because Bran and Arya, they very much have a parallel plot line and Arya's entire experience in the House of Black and White definitely parallels Bran's experience <clears throat> in the... Uh, in the actual weirwood net. So yeah, that kind of makes sense. Um, we'll have to see if we find any sort of throne like thing inside the house of black and white as the sun drops below the window and begins to throw strange shadows this way. So this is the shadow of my webcam. <laughs> that's, that's all right. That's okay. I'll stop being a dork. I'll just move over here into the shade. Perfect. But it is, is it a big throne or does Odin sit in Frigg's lap? Wouldn't it be the other way around? Maybe not. I don't know. That's pretty funny. I like the idea either way. <laughs> Isabel Lamego, you're great. I may have to mod you up too. Where's this? In fact, I am going to do it. I'm going to mod you up if I haven't already. That way I'll always see your comments when you make them. You're dropping too much knowledge here. Too much. There we go done and let's give jinty m1 two bam we're, we're giving out wrenches left and right thanks folks appreciate it. not that there's a whole lot of ban ban hammering that needs to be done here because you guys are such a respectful audience but yeah last call for questions guys i'm going to wrap it up i don't really have a whole lot else to say that's planned how will John react if Aegon is fake? Will he still support him? John's not going to give a flying F about Fagon. <laughs> I don't think. Um, and I think f he'll mostly be out of the picture by the time John comes into Danny's sphere, in my opinion. John really only cares about the others. So 10 minutes to 420 in California. Why? So it is. So it is. <clears throat> But of course. <laughs> yeah, there's somehow no colonialism apologists in the chat today. Um, I, I banned the couple that, that surfaced in the comments of my last video. So I, there may have only been those couple. I don't think there's, there's a ton of those folks hanging around. So Freyr, I have not looked up. There's there's Freya, and then there's um, I guess it would be Freyer, who's uh, I have not looked up his thing. I know that he is uh, House Frey is got some Freyer symbolism, but uh, I haven't looked it up, so I don't have a, I don't have um. Oh, John Con, oh that makes more sense. That makes a lot more sense. Okay, thank you, Michael. So how will what will John Con's reaction be? if Fagon is exposed as being fake. Oh, well, that has to happen, doesn't it? 
<laughs> I almost think he won't care almost. He'll be like, I'm so fixated on this idea. I'm just going to carry through it. But we are looking for John Con to kind of lose it and go crazy. Um, the Battle of the Bells foreshadowing is there with the bells in King's Landing and the wildfire. So I think John Con's story is going to end in King's Landing. He's pushing aggressively because of the grayscale ticking clock that he has. And so, yeah, I think he's going to blow up a bunch of shit in King's Landing. And perhaps perhaps uh, the revelation that Fagon is fake will be something that helps break his brain. I like that idea. As I scroll back. Roose Bolton getting leached ASMR. <laughs> That's very good. Yes. More leeches, please. Ah, uh, that's nice. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I love the, f I love the feel of a little leech bite in the morning. I don't think so. That's not, that's not very comforting. <laughs> <clears throat> I can definitely do the Roos accent. I just don't think that'll make good ASMR. <laughs> Thanks. I hate it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> but yeah, continue guys in the comments. If you have more ASMR ideas, definitely throw them at me. The faceless men are like the Morgan, an Irish many faced God associated with war and death. Maybe Arya will fill a similar role to her. Oh, I, I should look that up because we know there is tons of Irish folklore in a song of ice and fire. I am not an expert. I've got to look this stuff up as I go to really know what's going on with it. So, <clears throat> that makes sense. I know there's Dogda symbolism and stuff going on, so I'll have to check that. Yeah, it's totally going to crush John Khan if if Fagon is fake, which he is. He's fake. Oh, yes, I'd have to overdub, like, the sound of leeches sloshing around in a bucket or something. <laughs> That's terrible. Oh, Who is the greatest warrior in real life history? Oh man, I've got no idea. I don't, I couldn't even tell you who the greatest warrior in a song of ice and fire is. True gone. I will look up the Morgan. Uh, where is it? Oh, I highlighted true gone again. <laughs> Morgan, queen of war, definitely Arya. Okay, so I'm, I'm seeing people are fired up about this idea. It's cool. <laughs> Rhaegar reading slash hostage corner was my favorite ASMR so far, yeah. <clears throat> Aim in the Dragon Knight. Always oh, now people are, are are chipping in for who's the who's the greatest fighter. Yeah, hard to say. Damon Blackfires is, is suggested as being kind of a badass too. He was only slain by an arrow. No one ever beat him in combat. Sir Arthur Dane. He's a chump. Screw Arthur Dane. He ain't shit. All right, cool, guys. Well, thanks for your suggestions. Thanks for the PayPals. Oh, I see one more PayPal. Oh, that's Amelia's. Okay, I got that already. It's coming in late. So thanks, guys. Like I said, if you didn't catch last night's Ham Dollar stream, we talked about the Horn of Winter, the Night's Watch, all kinds of cool stuff. And then today... Oh... Uh, you know, we did the Aria stuff. Next week, I will have uh, Ygritte with Elisa Patience. And if you haven't seen any of the Odin Origins videos, those are waiting for you there too. So pumping out the content lately. And once again, if you're not following me on Instagram, check that out. That is, I'm David Lightbringer on Instagram. I'm doing music recommendations, dancing bird, video, dancing bird music video recommendations, and uh, all kinds of other stuff. So... Check that out, and I will see you next week with Elisa Patience for the good stream. Uh, did the Lakers lose, by the way? It's time to go find out. All right, I'll see you.